All right, guys, everybody here for C++? Nobody wandered into the wrong class? Not that there are a lot of 830 classes here, so uh, I bet you are in the right place. So I'm Professor Thompson. You can call me Jeff. You can call me Professor Thompson. What we are going to do is we're going to learn C++. Today, we're going to go over the syllabus, and then we will launch Visual Studio and create our first C++ programmer uh, program, unless you've already done C++ before, in which case it won't be your first. You're going to need a textbook. You can get it online. I get it as the Kindle version. Kindle version's cheaper, or you can get it at the bookstore. If you rent it, make sure you get it back at the end of the semester. If you don't, they're going to charge you more than if you just bought it outright. Okay, so let's hit the syllabus. You can click over here on Start Here. There's the syllabus. When we're done, we're going to go take this quiz. Quiz is real easy. It's just typing in your name. And then there's a link for installing Visual Studio. You're going to want to install the development software at home. Are there any Mac users here? If you want to, you can bring your Mac in and you can do your work here on your Mac. As of recently, they've come out with a version of Visual Studio for Mac. Otherwise, um, you would want to use a development environment that, sh that ships with the Mac. Codebench? Don't remember. So uh, I hope you can install Visual Studio on your Mac and get it to work. I'll be really interested in hearing how it works. It's the first time since like 1995 that they've offered it for the Mac, Visual Studio. So that's kind of cool. Okay, so anyways, let's hit the syllabus. Whenever you see the preview window here that D2L offers you, it's okay for most things, but if you're looking at a PowerPoint, it's horrible. So if you ever want to, you can download the document. I strongly recommend you do that. By the way, um, not to veer suddenly, but if you click on content, Course Tools content, you find where the syllabus is stored, where the rest of the links are. There's going to be another folder here called Videos. I record every lecture, unless I make a horrible mistake. You'll be able to watch the lectures there. There'll be a play button. You can watch it there, but instead watch it on uh, watch it on YouTube. Just click the link, go to YouTube, watch it in the YouTube viewer, rather than in the little preview window. That way you get the whole thing. You could expand it to fill the screen. I find it to be better. Okay, back to the syllabus. As uh, always with computers, there's more than one way to find things. There's the quick links down the side of the main page, and then there's course tools contents. I actually prefer that one, but at least a quick link gives you a little hint as to where to start. So, open up the syllabus again. Download it. You don't have to download it. You can view it in the preview. So, here's our class. Course number 7078. When I send email out, it's going to include all of that information in it. CIT 1173.7078. If you want to write a special filter to flag my messages as the most important in the universe, that's totally cool. All right, so this is an introductory course. I do not assume much previous programming experience. 1113, um, the fundamentals of programming experience is just about all that is assumed here. That is a prereq. We will learn C++, which is a language that's descended from the C programming language that was invented back in 1970. C++ is kind of venerable. It's kind of, you know, it's been improved over decades and decades and decades. It's a very large, complex language now, but we're going to learn the simple parts first, and then we're going to build onto it, just like the language itself was invented. It was simple at first, and then people added onto it. Specifically, they added on the object-oriented aspects of it which we will also get. You'll get familiar with that term object-oriented. So we will utilize several program development tools and techniques. Specifically, we're going to learn uh, how to use the Visual Studio development environment. It's not the only way to write C++ programs. You can write a C++ program with a text editor, just something like Notepad. But then you're going to have to compile the file by hand, which means turning it into an executable, just like the executables that you install on Windows. 
or the .app files that you install on your Mac or what the packages you put on Linux or whatever. We will learn the core concepts of writing computer programs, variables, decisions, loops, functions, classes, and object-oriented programming while learning to use the Microsoft Visual Studio development environment. Well, congratulations, you're all in the correct room. So, course title, room number, prerequisites. If you took 1613 first, that's a Java course. You're already very familiar with the syntax that we're going to be following. You'll find C++ in some ways easier, in some ways a little more complicated. I'm Professor Thompson. I have a room downstairs. I will post my office hours in D2L. Apologize that they're not there yet. Here's my phone number. If you would be so kind, grab your phone and send me a text message with your name. Even those of y'all who have me in another class this semester or last semester. If you had me last semester, I've deleted all your numbers. If you have me this semester, it helps me sort it so that if I want to send a message to everybody in the C++ class, I know that you're part of it as well as the Java class or whatever. So send me a message at 898-7767. I see some people being reluctant to do though, do that. I really hope you will. That way I can send you messages if I know school is canceled today or if I'm too sick to teach or whatever. Um, you can send me messages if you're sick. And most important of all, really, is that if you're, doing, if you're writing your programs and you get stuck, take a picture of your screen with the code showing the error. Send it to me and I can usually like gift you an answer within five minutes. People find that to be a really fast way of getting help on programming problems and those who take advantage of it tend to do please stop Those of y'all who take advantage of taking pictures of your screen and sending it to me for help tend to do pretty well in the class. shows that y'all are motivated rather than just getting stuck and giving up. My campus email address, I know that y'all have .rater .rows. You leave off the .rater to send to me. If you do include it, it probably gets forwarded to me, but that is my proper email address, jgthompson at rose.edu. Delivery method, hybrid lecture and online. The videos are posted online, so if you miss a day, you can just watch the video. If you miss a day, I expect you to watch the video. If you miss a day and you don't watch the video and you don't, don't upload the daily assignment, then you're going to lose credit in the course. So it's pretty important to go back and watch the videos for any days that you miss. The textbook. You've already seen this information posted on the main page of D2L. If you haven't bought it already, get it pretty fast. That said, in the past I haven't said, okay, turn to page 173 and do programming problems 2, 3, and 4. The reason for that is that this textbook is used in 500 other colleges and people have posted the answers to every problem on the net. It's just a fact of life. So I create my own homework assignments. You, know, you get hand, uh, hand developed homework assignments to work on, but you need it to study with. We will also use the PowerPoints that accompany the textbook. Kindle version is the cheapest way of getting the textbook that I know of. You will also need a home computer or laptop capable of supporting C++ development environment. Doesn't have to be Microsoft Visual Studio, but that's what you're going to learn in here. If you're not using Microsoft Visual Studio, I will help you as much as I can. I can help the Mac users. If uh, you're using something radically different, I'm not going to be able to help you much, which is okay. You're just going to have to roll up your sleeves and do a little bit more work. And if you're a Linux user or whatever, you're used to that. We use D2L. So you're going to download all your assignments from D2L. You're going to work on your exams on D2L when you take your exams in the class. Your quizzes are going to be found, found there. All due dates are on it. You're just going to get real used to typing d2l.rose.edu. I'm sure you can get to this web page by going to rose.edu and finding a, you know, some link there. Just memorize it, d2l.rose.edu. Upon successful completion of the course, you should be able to do these things. I did start the recorder, didn't I not? Yay. All right. Last class, I went through the entire syllabus without having the recorder going. Understand fundamental concepts and general principles of programming. You're going to walk out of here knowing a lot more about how computers work than uh, you did in the past, especially those of y'all who managed to sneak in here without the, uh, the fundamentals of programming class. 
You're going to learn how to write, compile, Doug, deep Doug, debug, and run C++. Why would you learn C++? A lot of software is written in C++. Probably all the games that you download in Steam are written in C++ or maybe in C Sharp, maybe uh, some of them. You know, stuff that you run on your PlayStation is probably written in C++. A long time ago, games were written, um, you know, in what's known as assembly. But nowadays, games are so large that they have to have a more organized learn, uh, more organized framework. And C++ tends to be the one that is used because it is the fastest. It runs most quickly on your computer. If you're a Java developer or a Python developer or any other number of languages, those do not compile down to executables. The .exe files or the .app files for the Mac users or whatever run as fast as possible. And so that's a really good thing. For example, Chrome, I'm sure, is written in C++. Um, Microsoft Word, Excel, very commonly used language. Will I say it's the most commonly used language? No, I wouldn't. But once you learn C++, you're getting the same syntax that you will then need to use for Java. Very similar syntax. Also, that same syntax is used in JavaScript for development of web pages and for C Sharp for writing what are known as .NET applications. So you're getting a really good basis in a whole bunch of different programming languages by learning C++. If you're taking the Java course as well, some of the things are going to kind of just fight a little bit within your brain and you're just going to have to get used to the fact that, oh, I'm doing it this, I need to use this word. And I'm doing this, I need to use this word. Kind of like, you know, some languages, you know, romance languages are related but different. Italian and Spanish or something. I don't know my languages, but whatever. Grading scales, pretty... Uh, Typical, 90% is an A, 80% is a B, 70% is a C. If you're sitting right on the borderline, if you make an 89.5, yeah, I'm probably going to round up. I don't want to be a jerk about it. There's three broad categories of ways to collect points in a class. There's programming homework. That's when I give you an assignment and I ask you to write a program that meets the requirements. You'll find those in a Dropbox. Find the instructions for the Dropbox. Right now the Dropbox is empty because we don't have any homework due. But before the class is done, I'm going to create a, create a couple of Dropboxes. One for the stuff that we do in class, which is the next category. And then for the homework that I want you to have done by, uh, by Monday at midnight. So the in class of homework is when I'm up here typing, doing stuff. I need to delete that word and quizzes because quizzes are done here. So these are tutorials. You know, I'll write a program up here, or I could give you a handout, but I tend not to do that anymore. I tend to write it up here. You type along with me. If that turns out to be a problem, if uh, you have uh, typing skills that make that hard for you to do, we can talk about it. It kind of falls under um, the uh, disability thing, which I will hit up here. Or if you're just a slow typer, I understand that. Not everybody. I know that I type faster than probably 80 to 85 percent of y'all. Uh, I come from the old days when you actually had to take typing courses and when you were in college and high school and stuff like that. So tell me to slow down. I'll get a feel real quick if I'm going too fast, but tell me to slow down. It doesn't hurt my feelings. Talk back to me. Tell me if you don't understand something. When we're typing this stuff in, when we're doing the in-class assignments, I will wander around and make sure that everybody's got everything working. If you get syntax errors, uh, if it's not working right, I will help you find and correct those. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, where was I going with that? But if you're stuck and I'm not wandering around, maybe I forgot to wander around. Maybe we've gone too far in the program without me making sure that everybody's okay. Just wave your hand. Hey, Mr. Thompson, come back. So I'll go over there and I'll check it. Never hurts to ask anything. If you have a question, there's probably five other people with the same question. I guarantee that to be true. And the people who ask the most questions, I like you the most. That's a silly thing to say. But you know what I mean. You're interacting. You're learning more than the people who just sit there and don't understand something but don't ask. So the grading policy. Programming assignments must be able to run in order to get any credit. And I'll give you an example of that once we start going. Once we create our in-class assignment, um, we could write a program that doesn't run. If you turned it into me, I wouldn't give you any credit. Partial credit will be awarded for assignments that do run, but they don't meet the criteria. I asked you to write a program that would, you know, print out the, all the letters of the alphabet, and you only wrote, you know, printed out the first 10 letters. It doesn't work. 
doesn't do everything it's supposed to do, you're going to get partial credit, 50%, 70%, whatever. But then I will put in the comment, in the feedback, I will say, please revise. I'll tell you what's wrong. I'll say it doesn't print all the letters. I'll say, please revise for more credit. So then you just change your program. You submit it again. You know, you probably get a 90% or whatever. You know, you raise it to an A. Programming assignments are generally due one week from the day they are assigned, but you will always know because it'll be in the Dropbox. And, you know, obviously I'm not going to make something due over Thanksgiving break or whatever, so, you know, you'll have additional time when uh, something falls on a spring break day, excuse me, a fall break day or, uh, or Thanksgiving. If you get the homework done by midnight on the day that it's assigned, you get the 5% grading bonus, which can build up as time goes by. However, it's late, you start getting deductions. First, it's a 10% deduction for the first week. After the first week, it's 25% off. So the max you can make is a 75. After two weeks, it's a, you only get half credit. After three weeks, you only get 25% of the total. And then, you know, pretty much after a whole month, you sure have had a lot of time. You're not going to get any credit for it. The in-class stuff. If you miss a day, you watch the video, I really want you to turn that around within two weeks. Unless you have a real strong reason, you know. If you go on TDY and you wind up missing a bunch of class or whatever, I'm going to understand that. It's going to be a struggle for you to keep up, but I'll work with you on it. You know? Or if, you know, you have an illness that takes you out of class for, you know, a week or two or whatever. You know, you have to fly up to Canada to take care of your parents' funerals or whatever. That's kind of grim. So, yeah, let me know why something is being late. And I'll probably waive a late fee on it, you know, or at least give you less of the, uh, of the penalty. So if that happens, when you upload your file, when you finally do get it done, remind me. Just say, program is late because, you know, I had the flu. I told you about it. You said I'd get credit. I go, okay, no problem. And I'll get you the credit. But you have to communicate with me or else that's not going to happen. Penalties for late assignments might be waived. That's just what I said. But you better let me uh, know. You have to complete at least 50% of the programming assignments in order to pass the course. Because you can just come in here and type along with me and get, you know, a lot of credit in the course, but you don't learn much. You're learning something from the typing along. You're building up, you know, a good memory. But until you actually write your own programs, the information is not really locked in. So you have to do at least half of the homework. And by homework, I mean homework, not the in-class typing along of the tutorials. Attendance, I don't count off for attendance, but the people who attend regularly make better grades usually. If there are reasons you need to be gone, that's fine. I know that it's a late class. I hope your work doesn't interfere with it. And I'll work with you if you have some reason that you can't be here. But uh, in general, being here is far better than actually just watching a video. All right, don't do anything that's distracting. Don't play on your phone or visit, you know, for trick. 4chan or something like that on your screen. Nothing on your screen that would distract the people sitting behind you, including games. No smoking campus, no vapes. You need to check D2L regularly. If I post something on D2L, like a due date, I don't send email out about it. You're responsible for it. I'll only send email out about the most important you know, announcements. If something changes drastically, like a syllabus, or we change an exam date or something, I'm sure going to send the email out about it. If I need to modify the syllabus for some reason, I will post about it on D2L. I will also email it to y'all, pointing out the change so that you know. I don't see why that would need to happen. So what's my job? My job is to give you all the tools you need in order to learn it. You have to learn it yourself, but I'm going to provide clear instructions for assignments. If they're not clear, ask me for clarification. If you don't understand the assignment, then half the other class doesn't understand it either, and I need to correct it. So I love the people who ask me questions. Text me a message, say, you know, assignment 10, I don't understand. What do you mean by this? And I'll go and I'll email everybody with a correction to the assignment or whatever. To answer questions regarding those assignments, whether you ask them in person, email, phone, or text, I will always give you a week's notice of due assignments. And by week, I mean like if we are here on a Tuesday, then it's due Monday at midnight. If we're here on a Thursday, it's due Wednesday. You may get additional time sometimes if I think that, you know, if it seems appropriate. But you never have to wonder. All you have to do is check D2L. I will 
Try my best to grade all homework within a week of submission. Check your feedback on it and you'll see if you need to revise it and re-upload it for full credit. All important class announcements, assignments, and due dates will be in D2L. Everything you do will be found there. If you send me email, I try to get back in 24 hours. If you send me text messages, I get back much more quickly. I won't write your programs for you, but I'll look at what you've written. Send me a picture. Of, send it to me in email. Usually I can spot it just from a snapshot, but if I can't, I'll ask you to email me the code. If that doesn't work, come visit me at your office, especially if you have a laptop. You know, you can bring your laptop, sit down, I'll sit with you, and then we'll work on it together. We can solve a lot of programming problems that way. Academic integrity. Don't cheat on stuff. Enough said? No, I'm going to keep lecturing on it. And for those who have sat through this lecture a couple of times, I apologize. What academic integrity means is you need to approach your assignments with honesty and integrity, meaning you don't work together on homework assignments. You do your own work. You don't work together on quizzes. You do your own work. When you're taking an exam, I let you all use your computers and your notes and stuff during your exam. So that's great. But don't sit there and be on your phone texting somebody asking for help. If you need help on something during an exam, raise your hand. I'll probably come over there and give you some help. And if it turns out to be a badly worded question or whatever, I may come up here and give the answer to everybody. So don't be sitting there sending email to each other during the exam or asking anybody else. Don't turn in stuff from previous semesters that you get from somebody else. If you've taken this course before, from me, then a lot of the assignments will look similar, and uh, you know, I can't prevent you from turning in the same work. But I don't think that's true of any of y'all. If uh, one thing to watch out for is if you have asked you for help, say, "Can I look at your program? I'm having some problems." And you go, "Okay." You share your program, and you're feeling sneaky, so you just submit her program. I have this claiming it's yours. That happens, and then unfortunately I have to get on both of y'all's cases pretty harshly. So, I know you're not going to do that. I'm just pointing at you for the fun of it. All right, so the last thing you can do that's, uh, well, people can find endless ways of cheating, but don't go online, copy a bunch of code, paste it into yours, and then, up, and then upload it as your own work. Google is your best friend for solving programming problems. You need to learn how to, you know, create, you know, a binary file in C++. You know, you type that in, you scroll up and down, you find a nice example, and you go, okay, that looks pretty good. You copy that and you paste it. You upload that as though it were your own work. I'm probably going to spot that it's not your work, and it's going to be counted as cheating. So what you do is you Google it up. You see how why that works, how that works, and then you incorporate it into your own stuff. Just like when you're doing a paper, you know, in an English class. You take a source, but you reword it, and then you send it. All right, consequences of it. If you do cheat, you'll get a zero on that assignment, or worse, on that exam, which would bring your grade way down. Also, it gets reported to the division dean, Mark Tippin, downstairs. And we'll talk to him, and if we feel it's appropriate, you'll be ejected from the class with an F. Serious business. Don't do it. Unfortunately, I have one or two people who do it every semester. Now, spread out over seven or eight classes, that's not a lot. I'm expecting none of y'all to do it. It's pretty rare. Pretty rare, but it always happens. Student support services. If you have a special need of any kind, if you need additional time to take exams because of a reading disability or whatever, you go and you talk to these people. Known as Student Access Services, used to be called the Office of Disability Services. There's a room for it at their brand spanking new Learning Resource Center. There's a phone number that you can call. And anyways, you go there, you tell them, you know, what you need. They'll come up with some possible solutions, whether you need to sit in a certain row, whether you need to be able to vid videotape or, you know, or audio tape the entire lecture. You know, that's why I, I do it. It kind of obviates that. If you need extra time on exams, any of that can be given to you. I just need to know about it. The way I find out about it is you go to this office and you answer some questions from them. And then uh, they'll help you tell me about it. All righty. The last page here is just how to access this stuff. You probably already know how to check your email. But in case you don't, 
you just go straight to gmail.com and your account name is your first name dash last name at raider.rose.edu. Now that's not what you use to log into the computers and stuff. I bet every single one of y'all knows how to log in, so I'm not going to talk about this stuff. If you don't know how or you don't know your user ID, anything like that, then um, you can go to the support desk site, click it, ask for help. They'll give you a return phone call, get it fixed up. But everybody here has got D2O going, right? You all know how to use it? Okay, good deal. All righty. Now that we've read that, I hope anybody, everybody understands it. Are there any questions as I've presented it so far? Feel free to ask. I should give bonus points to people ask questions. Of course, then people ask questions until midnight. But yes, sir. There's only a few places where you could run into that. And if you're using Microsoft Visual Studio, you're not going to hit it at all. If you're installing another C++ environment, there may be places where it acts just a little bit different, but probably not. Honestly, I've only found like two cases in the past five years that I've taught C++ where anybody had a language difference. And I wouldn't count you off for that. I would probably be able to correct it, and then I would tell you, okay, next time you need to do this. That makes sense? Very good question because you do get different versions of the language. If you go out to the Wikipedia page, you'll see that C++ has a whole bunch of different versions. We're using the, a, a pretty modern version. It's not going to have been changed much since before 2011 or whatever, so we're all going to be good. It's uh, cross-compatible with a lot of different C++ compilers. Speaking of compilers, you're going to need to install and use Visual Studio, as I mentioned, or another C++ development environment on your computer. I recommend Visual Studio. To do that, I have a link over here in Contents. Over here in Start here, there's Installing Visual Studio. And I think I'll link to it in the main page as well to make it easier to find. To get it, you're going to log on to a site called Microsoft Imagine. It used to be called DreamSpark. There's a URL here, dreamspark.rose.edu. You go to dreamspark.rose.edu. Then you're going to register for an account. When you register your account, you're going to give you know, your Raider email address. And then you'll click continue. And Arlene Haynes manages this stuff. And within just a few hours, most likely, you're going to get authorized to do this. So don't wait until the last day to, to register. You know, Do this real soon. Get the registering done real soon. And then from here, you're going to download Microsoft Visual Studio. The version that we're using in this class is an, is an older version of it maybe because we don't have Windows 10 installed or whatever, we are using Visual Studio 2013. If you want to download that one, that's totally cool. If you want to get the latest and greatest, 2017 or whatever, that's also totally cool. So uh, it will just look a little bit different than what you're used to seeing to in class. And if you have a later version of it at home, then when you bring it here and you try to open that project, this old version from 2013 is going to complain about it. It's, it's not an impossible problem to solve. Just letting you know it's easier to take stuff home and work on it than it is to bring it back here and work on it. That's why I love it when people have laptops. It's totally okay to bring a laptop to class and work on it rather than these, these computers. So you're going to need that. You're going to need to go there, download Microsoft Visual Studio. That's actually your first homework assignment. There will be a Dropbox for it. Right now, there's not a Dropbox. Why don't we make one right now? Install Visual Studio or another C++ environment. We're going to make that due a week from today. So y'all can get it you know, done over the weekend or whatever, if not sooner. 
a, a week being midnight of the day before. And I will attach a Word document with the link to go get it. If you're not going to install C++ at all, you have a Chromebook or something, you know, you can't do any development on it, you can instead create a text file or a Word document or something and upload it it's saying, I'm going to do all my work at school. And that's okay, it's just not to your advantage, you know, because it's way better to be able to work late at night, you know, doing your homework rather than only come in during the office, the uh, time that the computer lab across the hall is open. Okay, so we have one Dropbox here open. Obviously, you're not going to upload anything into it right now. And um, I forgot the other thing to do, which is that after you've read the syllabus, which we all have, go and take the quiz, the first quiz. Take this quiz as soon as you read the syllabus. You can find it over quick links, or you can just choose course tools, quizzes. Is it a tough quiz? No, it's just one answer. You get to put your name in it. So take this quiz as soon as you read the syllabus. I'll do it with you. So I'm going to go to course tools, quizzes. Click on that, click start, except I don't have a start button on mine. And you'll see where it says, I have read the syllabus and understand it. Once you do this, type in your full name, go ahead and do that. That way nobody can say that they don't understand that they're not supposed to be copying files off of each other or downloading stuff. You underland, you understand, you know, the late fees and stuff not fees, the penalties for turning stuff in late, stuff like that. And you're going to get full credit, of course, for that. And it actually counts as one of your quiz grades. So, boom, you got 100 on a quiz right away just for doing that. Okay, let's actually launch Visual Studio. How do you do that? Well, it's not docked down here in the, in the taskbar yet. So go to the little search box, type in Visual Studio, and then you see it like up at the top. Go ahead and click it. And once it starts running, you may as well pin it to your taskbar. You Windows users are used to doing that. Right click on it pin this program to taskbar, that way it's always there, ready for you. Okay, what you see when you launch Visual Studio is this Solution Explorer over here, and then there's this window where your code is going to be, where your C++ stuff is going to be. So let's do that, let's make a C++ project. Sometimes they call it a project, sometimes they call it a solution. They, they mix, mix those terms together, I don't know why. File, new, project. Has everybody got Visual Studio open? Because if I, if you don't, it's, uh, I'll just have to work through it again. No problem. All right, it turns for a little bit. We've got a million different choices here because Visual Studio lets you do a whole bunch of things. What do we want? We want Visual C++. Empty project. And that's pretty much what we're going to do every time. Then we're going to want to give it a good name. You can call it short zero because I'm going to number this assignment zero. You'll notice that I number everything with a zero. Your first quiz was quiz zero. Your first homework is homework zero. Your first short assignment is uh, is short assignment zero. And there's a reason for that. Uh, I'll get into that at a certain point. It's just to get you used to the idea that if that computer start counting as zero rather than one. Sounds silly, but it's true. Okay, so you could call it short zero, or if you feel like giving it a better name, you could call it hello world. Don't put a space in your name in, of it. So I'm going to call this one Hello World, and I'm going to click OK. So I've chosen Empty Project under C++. I gave it a name of Hello World. You can put these in a different location than what it gives you by default. If you look, it's in a really weird place right now. It says Users, Local Admin, Documents, Visual Studio. That's kind of weird. I recommend putting it in a different folder. What I'm going to do is I'm going to click Browse, and you don't have to do this, but it makes it easier to find it when you want to upload the file. 
browse desktop and why don't we just make a new folder called C++ and then do select folder. That'll make those projects a lot easier to find. Then I'm going to click OK. It spins a little bit. Creating project. Okay, great. It created a project. It's got a, a directory out on the hard drive with some subfolders and stuff like that, but there's still nothing out here. The Java developers may be used to seeing um, when you do a new project, it actually creates a .java file for you, but we chose empty projects, so there's nothing there. We're doing everything ourselves. We're rolling our own. We're going to do we're going to right click on the thing that says source files. And I know the text is too small, but where it says source files, right click on it and do add new item. All right, what new item are we going to add? We're going to add a C++ file. You get to specify the name of the file. If you want to, you can call it the same as the name of the project, hello world or whatever. Or if you just want to leave it source.cpp, I understand that as well. I think I will call mine hello world.cpp. All right, now we're going to add what's known as boilerplate. Boilerplate is all the stuff that pretty much every program you write has to have in order to work. Why didn't it put it there automatically? Well, we told it to create an empty project. So we're going to have to memorize this stuff. If you want to save this as a text file or something and then open it up and copy and paste it, that's also good. But it's a good idea to have it uh, memorized. So the, our first lines should be a comment with our name and date. A comment is something that's ignored by the program. It's just like writing on the margin of a book. So let's put our name. Don't type Jeff Thompson. And the date. August 22, 2017. And let's put what this is. Short assignment zero. Hello world. All right. Now, if we compiled and ran this, it's going to do absolutely nothing because there is no code in it yet. Compile um, comments are not programs. Now we're going to tack some stuff on. Add this word, include, excuse me, I forgot to say the word pound sign. Pound sign or hashtag include, and then use the angle brace, the shift comma, less than sign, whatever we want to call it, less than, and type in IO stream. And notice that the editor is trying to help us. It's popping up these things as we type. So that so that we could try to choose that. That's one of the things that a good development environment, a good so-called integrated development environment does. It's got this, what Microsoft calls IntelliSense. It senses what you're typing and it tries to fill it in. Okay, so IOStream is what lets our program print messages to the screen or let them, the user type stuff in. That's, we're going to be adding that to pretty much every single program we write. We're also going to include one more, pound sign include less than string greater than. Now, have we written any programming yet? Still no. What these include statements says is I'm going to use something from a library known as IOStream. And I'm going to use something from a library called String. That's just like getting a book from the library, you know. Um, it doesn't do anything yet. You actually have to open the book and do something with it. We're going to add one more line of boilerplate. Using namespace, and your Python programmers are rolling your eyes going, man, we didn't have to do all this in Python. You're right. That's why we learned Python first. Using namespace std semicolon. std standing for standard. We're almost there. We almost get to write some programming now.
type this in. Next line, void space main. And you're going to learn what all this stuff does. Right now, you know, it's just like uh, you're marching blindly. And you will learn what this stuff does. Okay, so void main, and these are parentheses. You know, shift 9, shift 0. And then on the next line, do a curly brace, which is next to the P. You're going to hold shift and then get the, uh, the curly brace next to the P. Once you do that, it's going to add its own closing brace. What the braces do is they denote a block of code. You Python programmers have denoted blocks of code by tabbing. C++ and Java and these kind of things use curly braces to denote your blocks of code. Alrighty. Let's create what's known as a variable. We have to declare the variable, which means we have to give it a type. We have to say what kind of data we are going to store in our variable. We're going to say string name is equal to, and then we're going to give a name. Bugs Bunny. Put your name there, put in one of the X-Men, whatever you want. <clears throat> so this is a variable. A variable is a named place in memory that has three parts. Or is a named place in memory that contains a value. Value meaning a name or a number or something more complex than that. It's composed of three parts. It's got a type, the data type, whether it's a number or a word or something. It's got a variable name. What do you want to call your variable? You know, In this case, we called our variable name. And then the last thing it's got is a value. So the type of this variable is string. The name of this variable is name. The value of the variable is Bugs Bunny. Let's declare another variable. int age is equal to 0. So the type of this is int. The variable name is age. The value is 0. <coughs> Ints are whole numbers. So we can't say int age is equal to 3.2. If you do, it'll just round it off to 3. All right, let's use our variables. Let's do this. C out less than less than hello comma world exclamation mark end quote and when I say quote I mean the double quotes not the single apostrophes followed by the word E-N-D-L that's an L not a 1 lowercase l. Let's actually stop there but there's one more piece of boilerplate we have to add, and I should have shown it at the very beginning. Here, I'll show you why. I'm going to run it without adding it. It's churning. It's churning. Whoops. It ran it. It's done. It closed the window. We didn't get to see what it did. So I'm going to add one more thing down here at the bottom, which is the word system. Parentheses, quotes, and inside the quotes, I want pause. This isn't going to work for your Mac users or your Linux users when you go at home, but you probably won't need it. So you just leave that line off. Now, what does pause do? Well, system runs a program in what's known as the command line. The command line is like if you were an old DOS user and you had a window like that. If I type pause here, it says press any key to continue. That's just exactly what it's going to do here. Is it's going to do all of this stuff, and then it's going to display the message, press any key to continue. If I need to make the text larger for the people in the back, let me know. The drawback is that the less screen, I mean, you can't see as much code. So I try to pick a happy medium. So there's our program. We have some comments describing what variables are. Are we ever going to type comments in describing what a variable is? Probably not. There's no need to. You're learning it now, and then you'll learn it again later when we hit the PowerPoints. 
I'm going to run build the program, which you don't strictly have to do. I'm going to choose the build menu, build solution, or rebuild solution. Either one is, is good enough. What that does is it runs the compiler, which takes this English-like writing and turns it into executable machine language. What is machine language? It's the stuff that actually makes the computer do something, and it's all just ones and zeros. I was hoping to see some build successful messages. There they are. Down here you see rebuild all started. It tells you what file it's building and that it succeeded. If it failed, we'd get a different message down here. We might have some errors to correct. Maybe some of y'all have some errors to correct. We'll find out real soon. Now I'm going to actually run it. I'm going to click local Windows debugger. I'm going to click the green arrow and it runs it and it says, hello world. Press any key to continue. So we, we've written our first C++ program now. Excuse me, but I'm going to make the font larger, easier to read. All right. Hello, world. Press any key to continue. I'm going to pause this and wander around and make sure everybody's got All right. Hello, world is like the uh, first program that you write in a lot of textbooks, dating all the way back to 1970 when the first uh, documentation for the C language was written. Yeah. They showed how to write hello world and the reason why everybody does that is you actually learn a lot about the way the program language is structured just by seeing that if you compare this to java code you'd see that it looked fairly different you guys who set through java and then come in here you got to admit that there are some differences and then there are some similarities you python programmers have not seen a lot of this stuff yeah, you had some way of getting uh, libraries in. You use the import word. You certainly didn't use this using namespace word. You didn't have to create a function just to get your code to work. Every program you write is going to need a main function. Main function tells the computer where to actually start executing your code. Without a main function, like what if I uh, called it low main, har, 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 then um, when I run it, it says there are build errors. If I go and I find the errors, see down here you see error listing. It says entry point must be defined. Well, it would have been nicer if it said you don't have a main. You know, why don't they speak, you know, clearly? Well, they're they're speaking very precisely and they don't really care, you know, about uh, making it understandable to general users. Entry point must be defined. The entry point is where the program would start running. It's not defined because we don't have a main. So we put main there. This is what's known as a function declaration. All the code we write is either going to be in the main function or it's going to be in another function that we write. We could add our own functions to it. Now this line, using namespace. You'll see a lot of programmers out on the internet, if you Google up a C++ code, leave that line out for reasons I'm not going to mention right now. But if I delete that line, I have to make some changes to my code. I'll show you what that is. I'm not going to delete it, though. I'm just going to comment it out. And you go ahead and do this as well. Even though it's going to break your code, do it. Comment out that line with a slash slash using namespace. All of a sudden, we have these red lines all over the place in our code. We have to fix those by doing this. Find the first one with a red line, which in my case is that word string, and type in std colon colon. Scroll down to the next error, which should be that C out word. In front of that C out word, add std colon colon. And I see one more, this ENDL. That's an L, not a 1. Type in std colon colon in front of that. So, what this using namespace std means is that there is a set of commands, a set of words that are available from this library, std, 
And by doing using namespace, we're able to skip typing that stuff in. It's kind of like you go to a family reunion and you know everybody there is called Thompson. Then you don't have to say, hello, Jeff Thompson. You can just say, hello, Jeff. You know, it assumes this. So it shortens your programming a little bit in order to have that. If I take that off, I don't have to pref prefix all of the stuff that came out of that library with STD. And you had your hand raised. So does that make it like it's global, so that it just hits everything in the lower Ex Exactly, exactly. And there is a namespace called a global variable, which we will talk about. But yeah, if uh, you use this halfway through, I wonder what would happen. Never actually had anybody ask that. Um, if I go down here and then do that, can I do that? And then take it off here? It looks like I can. But it's just not good form. I, mean. I don't see why I would do that. Yeah, I would put all my using namespaces right under the pound sign include. Okay, so includes are bringing libraries in. Namespaces are groupings of commands under a certain name. You can just about always not use any namespaces, but you have to fully qualify the name of the object. Fully qualify meaning the entire path. You know, if you were going to give a fully qualified path to Rose College, you'd say, you know, Earth dot, you know, United States dot, yeah, I can't spell, Oklahoma dot Midway City dot Rose, yeah, <laughs> whatever. That's a fully qualified path. It, it tells you exactly how to get to Rose College, and you, know, you might put your street, you know, whatever. So this is a fully qualified path to this variable type right there, and this, uh, that's about enough of that. I don't need a lecture about that anymore. I'm just always going to do using namespace STD, and I just want you to have memorized that you could take it out and that good programmers do take it out typically. Why am I doing it in here? Because it saves us time. Every keystroke <laughs> save is, uh, is useful. All right. I'm going to wander around again, make sure I haven't broken your... This one, IO stream. Like I said, gives us the ability to send output to the screen and to read input from the screen. Here we are sending output to the screen. This is what's known as a stream. It's a weird word. I mean, not that stream's a weird word, but uh, you don't think about computers having streams in them. This is the output stream. It stands for character, excuse me, console output. Like back in the old days when you had just a green screen monitor, that was called your console. This sends output to the console. If you want to ask the user a question and get some input, you can also use console input. That's called an input stream. This is an output stream. Let's do that. Let's ask the, the user for their age. Now, you Python users are used to being able to do this in one step. You just do x is equal to input, parentheses, you know, and you have some quotes. we got to do it in two steps. We have to... Display the question, see out what is your age, and we may as well tack on an inline there, E and DL, and now we're going to let them type it. So we're not going to use the output stream, we're not going to use see out, we're going to use CIN, and we're not going to use less than, less than, we're going to use greater than, greater than. And since we asked for their age, we may as well do something with it. So let's display one more message. See out, less than, less than, your name is, end quote, two more less thans, followed by the variable called name, and then I do semicolon and hit return. You're going to get used to the fact that almost every line ends in a semicolon, which you did not have to do in Python. It 
Now let's write out their age as well. So on the next line, do one more C out, arrow, arrow, less than, less than. I use the word arrow for some reason. And then I'm going to put a space here. No, I'm not. I'm going to leave the space out. And your age is space, end quote. Two more arrows, followed by the age variable, followed by ENDL. All right, now I'm going to run it, and then I'm going to ask some questions. It says, what is your age? I ran it. It says, what is your age? I'm going to type in an age while I'm feeling like I'm 78. And here's what it says. Your name is Bugs Bunny, and your age is 78. Why did it not put a space here between the word, the name, and the word and? What could I do to fix that in my code? Put a space before and. Yeah, I just need to come here and put a space there. Make your output pretty by adding spaces so that weird things like that don't happen. The next question. Why did I use ENDL here and not there? How did that affect this output? Oh, did that add? <clears throat> the lines came together. Right, right. This next line and your age is 78 was on the same one as the line before it. So every time it's like hitting enter or return on a typewriter. If you want it to go to the next line, you have to do that ENDL. So there's not a slash T or anything? That... You can also use a slash to do that. I'll, I'll, I'll mention that real quick. Good point. Um, the reason I'm making a big deal of that is the Python programmers are used to not having to add ENDL or a slash in or anything to go to the next line. Your print command did it for you. If you want, there's another way of getting a carriage return embedded. So let's add one more line. C out, arrow, arrow, quote, I, followed by a backslash, lowercase n, the backslash is the one above the enter key, not below the question mark, love, backslash n, c++, backslash n. And then followed by an end quote and a semicolon. If you ever find that the green button is grayed out, it just means you have an old version of the program still waiting to be closed. And that is the case here. I can't run it because I still have the old window open. I just need to close that last one, and then I can run it again. So I do build, rebuild solution. Not strictly necessary, but I'm, uh, I like to be very thorough. Then I choose the green arrow. I run it. What is your age? Well, I'm feeling like I'm 54. My name is Bugs Bunny, my age is 54, and then it says I love C++. So what do these slash ins do? The same thing as ENDL, except I didn't have to type a close quote, you know, and then a couple of extra. This is what's known as an escape sequence. Give a technical name for it. Escape sequence for going to the next line. And that dates all the way back to the 70s, long before they came out with ENDL as being a way to send the output to the next line. So if you look at it, it prints I, followed by hitting the enter key, love, followed by the hitting the enter key, C++, followed by hitting the enter key. Somebody take a guess before I run it. What's going to happen if I remove the, back, the last slash in? What's the output going to look like? Here's what the output looks right, right, like right now. It's going to say I love C++, and then... This next line is going to be right on the same line. So it's not going to look too cool. Once you write a program that asks for input, you get really annoyed with entering it over and over. So it says, I love C++, press any key to continue. Am I going to count you off for that press any key to continue being glued against your own output? Nah. But go ahead and make it look nice. Add that slash, that last ENDL or backslash in or whatever to make it look good. All right.
we've written, written, we've written our first program in this language. Notice the direction, the uh, way that the arrows point. If you're sending output, the arrows point towards the output going out. If you're getting input, the arrows come away from the word into the variable. So here we're sending this stuff out, and here we're getting stuff in and storing it in H. Just kind of have to remember that, and I guarantee I'm going to make a mistake up here when I use the wrong arrows. So you probably will too. I'll have to correct myself and ask you all to correct it too. What would happen if it was the wrong thing? Well, if I do this, because I forget, you know, don't type this because it's wrong. It underlines it in red. Just cannot use those arrows with C out. You have to use the others. Okay. Why don't we be done? We're getting close to the end of our time here. I'm going to make a Dropbox for this, and we're going to talk about how to upload it. I recommend just closing the whole shebang before we mess with it any further. Click the X. Get Visual Studio to go goodbye. All right, if you refresh your Dropbox, you'll see that we have two broad categories now. We have homework. All your homework assignments are going to be listed under there, and then we have in-class assignments. I actually meant to put a zero in front of that as well. I will correct that. I'm, and I made a mistake. You probably are not seeing the word, hello, world. They added something to it just this semester where if it says, once I create a folder, it's hidden from users until I go under restrictions and remove that restriction. Irksome. All right, now refresh the Dropbox and you'll see Hello World. Let's, in, let's upload our document. The vast majority of y'all already know how to use D2L. I put the wrong... Where'd my 10.30 p.m. go? I didn't save my changes, did I? Well, at least it's not hidden. Whatever. All righty. All right. Now it's got the right date on it, too. You, you click on the folder name, the Dropbox name, Hello World. You click Add a File. We need to go and find that CPP file. So you click Upload, and you go to whatever directory your C++ files are stored in. If you followed my lead, you created a C++ folder off the desktop. If you want to, you could uh, bring a flash drive, you know. Eh. Anyways, yeah, that's a good point. You're going to want to make a second copy of your work. One way to make a second copy is just submit it to the Dropbox. You know, that way you can go and you can download it again when you get home. Anyways, so I clicked Upload. I need to find that folder. Mine is in C++. I double-click that, and here's a project folder. I, you could either send me the whole project folder, or you can just find a CPP file. I'm equally happy with either one. Sending a CPP file is a little bit easier, but we have to dig a little bit farther into the directories. I double-click the directory, and then there's another folder with the same name, Thank you very much. I have to go into that one as well, and then I find the CPP. If you don't see the word CPP, that's because your machine is not configured to show extensions. Let's do that right now. Go to Organize. I may not be able to do it from here. Sorry. Come down here on the taskbar and open the Windows Explorer folder, and then choose Organize 
folder and search options. Do you see what I did? I just opened the uh, folder down here in the taskbar and then under organize I choose folder and search options. Then there's three tabs. Click on that middle tab that says view and one of the options is hide extensions. You don't want to hide extensions. Extensions are really useful information. You're probably going to upload the wrong file if you have hide extensions clicked. So you deselect that, click OK, and then when we go back over here, we see .cpp. Why do I say to do that? Because a lot of people are going to upload this file, or this file, and those files don't have any programming code, and I can't give you credit. You have to give me the cpp file. You can kind of see if it's right, because it'll say C++ source over there, but enable your extensions. Anyways, you can select that file, click open, that attaches it, but you got to then click add, you're almost there, then you got to click submit. Just like once you attach an email attachment, you still have to click send. All right, now I'm going to do it the other way. You don't have to do this, but I want to show you how to get the entire project to me. And your Mac users need to if you're going to do this, do this before you upload it, because you can't do it in the upload window like you can on a PC. I'm going to go back into the project, excuse me, Dropbox, click Add File. I'm going to click Upload. I need to find my C++ folder again. There's my project, Hello World. I want to send the whole project in one fell swoop, so I right click on it and then choose Send to Compressed Folder. I know you can't read that, but it's either the top or the second to the top option under Send to. So right click on it, choose Send to Compressed Folder, and that makes a zip file. The zip file has the whole project stored in it, all the subfolders, all the subfiles that are created. I'm happy with each. You don't have to do both like, we, like I just did. You don't even have to do both right now. I just want you to, to get the, I, I want you to get it up there one way or the other, by hook or by crook. And once you get it up there, you're done. We took roll, right? Did anybody come in after I took roll? Did we take roll? All righty, we didn't take roll. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording so I can take roll. All right, bye-bye, you home watchers.